Hey, greetings everybody. GleeCon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last one, we finally got to see, as we're getting here to the end of the third uh, part of this Dawn of the Aspects little series, we finally got to see who is this cloaked figure that seemingly has time-traveling powers. Um, and a little bit of where the artifact is. We had already kind of seen research by Jaina showing that it was probably a Keeper artifact, and, and that just made sense. And now we learn that that figure is Tyr, is a Keeper, and he has the artifact. So stay a while and listen to this one. It's Chapter 5 as we wrap up the third part of Dawn of the Aspects. This one's called The Dead and the Undead. <clears throat> like, that's like a, like a Clint Eastwood supernatural title. <clears throat> Jaina woke with a start, her head snapping up from the pages of the musty book she was reading when exhaustion had claimed her. The Archmage eyed the faint moisture on one page and gestured with some slight irritation. The page dried, none the worse for the wear. She was drooling on the book. Another waste of time. She pointed her finger at the wall of books and parchments. The book fluttered to the spot from which she had summoned it. That time. Thoughts other than her own abruptly filled her head. Messages sent by various magi seeking her advice or reminding her of tasks she should have been working on instead of this increasingly futile quest. Jaina knew that her position demanded that she deal with these other matters, but she rose from her chair and once more approached the trove of magical knowledge. Before she could make a decision, another voice overwhelmed the rest. Jaina, come quickly. Kale. <clears throat> the contact broke but not before she sensed from where he was calling. The location surprised her, but the Archmage did not hesitate. She exhaled and cast. Her arrival did not go as expected. She appeared not only many yards from where she had intended, but also more than a foot above the ground. The Archmage landed hard on her heels, the collision vibrating through her bones. Biting back an epithet worthy of her naval father, Jaina focused. Regaining her equilibrium, she surveyed the dark land before her, wondering why Kallik would call her to, of all places, the Dragon Blight. Moreover, the Archmage wondered why he would summon her not from the temple, but from the shadows of the incredibly vast skeleton ahead. <clears throat> Jaina knew of the huge bones that had once been a behemoth called Galakrond, but there her knowledge faded into what myths and legends the aspects had passed along over the millennia. When they did speak of Galakron, dragons made vague comments honoring him as the father of dragons. It was supposedly why so many of those dragons who came to die in the dragon blight chose to set their bodies if not facing Galakron, then certainly in the vicinity of his skeleton. Jaina concentrated on Kallax, silently calling his name and awaiting a link with his mind. When that did not happen, she sharpened her call by directing it toward the monstrous ribcage. But although there came no answer, Jaina could not help feeling that the skeleton was where she needed to go. A fear abruptly arose in her that Kallik might now lie injured or unconscious, or even worse, somewhere within the half-buried bones. A haze draped over the region, making it impossible for the Archmage to see anything inside the ribs. She probed with her power, but found nothing. No, for just a moment, Jaina thought she sensed Kallik. Without hesitation, she transported herself nearer. This time, the Archmage appeared where she desired. The ribs loomed over her. But of Kallik, there was still no sign. Jaina finally called his name. The only answer was the growing wind blowing through the bones. Aware that her destination had been this desolate place, using magic she had shielded herself from the expected cold, so that the chill that ran down her spine had nothing to do with the elements. Despite that, though, the Archmage did not hesitate to enter. The moment she did, she sensed something else. A faint magical trace that reminded her of the artifact's aura. The source of the trace proved to be a hole dug deep in the frozen ground. A hole that also radiated hints of Kallik's unique magical signature. This is where he found it, Jaina realized. He went to a lot of trouble to dig it out. Why? She looked over her shoulder, suddenly certain that she was not alone. Even though the Archmage saw nothing. She could not shake the feeling. Still, she returned her inspection, returned to her inspection of the hole. Searching beyond Kallik's trace, Jaina studied the residue of ancient magic continuing to permeate the area. It grew stronger the more she delved into the hole itself. The Archmage marveled at the efforts Kallik had used to free the artifact. And again came the question of why? 
The shadows around her deepened. Jaina created a small golden sphere and sent it into the hole to better, the better to see anything. An exasperated sigh escaped her. <laughs> she glanced around again, seeking either Kalak or some other figure. Jaina now knew that she was being led, but whether this was all a trap or something far different, the spellcaster could not say. Thus far, she detected no threat, but she also detected no reason for her being there. Her sphere changed color without warning, turning from gold to a deep blue. And in that blue light, Jaina Proudmoore saw something not evident before. It was not a physical object, but a force somehow tied to the relic that had been buried there. It was also something that she had seen once before and that she knew was recorded in the very tomes through which she had been burrowing before thinking she heard Kellek's summons. The artifact itself at last began to make some sense to the Archmage, but this only fueled her concern. If what she sensed about the magics involved in its creation was true, if what this radiant force meant to her study of the artifact was true, then there was something terrible going on that... Again, Jaina felt as if someone watched her. This time, she quickly cast a spell behind her, and for her efforts, she was rewarded with a slight grunt. Spinning around, she discovered a female Tonka standing only a few feet from her. Who are you? The Archmage demanded. Bunik. My name is Bunik. The Tonka rasped. Jaina's spell held the creature in place. The Tonka was armed with a spear, but Jaina saw that the weapon was held casually and had not been ready for throwing. What are you doing here? Auntie saw the light, thought it was another hunter. The Archmage could detect nothing amiss and finally released the Tonka. Bunik exhaled and stretched her arms, although she was also careful to keep her grip on the spear loose at all times. You're free to go, Jaina remarked, her tone indicating that she would prefer Bunik did as she suggested. The Tonka started to turn, then glanced past the spellcaster at the hole. He searched there too, the blue one. Blue one? Kalak? Jaina's mind raced. Before the Archmage could ask, the hunter abruptly added, He found something, I think. While the information was of some relevance to Jaina, it did not resolve anything for her. She nodded her thanks, her interest in the Tonka fading. Saw something else after he left. Jaina stared at her. What else did you see? What? Bunik hesitated. Saw another. All covered. All covered. A cloak. After Bunik bent her head forward in what was evidently a nod, the Archmage, now very much interested again, asked, You could make out nothing else about this figure. Tall. Taller than you. It looked into whole. Just like you. There had been no magical trace from some other spellcaster, at least not that Jaina had detected. With her skill, it was unlikely that she would have failed to notice that another mage had been there, unless... She needed to know more. Did this figure do anything? Yes, Bunik thought for a moment, then carefully passed the spear from one thick hand to the other. She raised her now freed hand and began to draw something in the air. Once finished, the Tonka stilled again. Jaina tried to make sense of whatever Bunik had done, but could not completely recall it. Draw it again, but slower. As Bunik began, the Archmage cast a simple but useful spell. <clears throat> Immediately, the air flared silver where the Tonka had started drawing. The hunter hesitated. Go on, please, Bunik. Exhaling, the Tonka obeyed. The silver fire followed as she completed the symbol. Jaina watched the ev with ever-increasing interest, all the while hoping that Bunik had a very sharp memory. The Tonka stepped back. Jaina summoned the glowing pattern to her, examined it for a second, and then with a grimace, turned it around so that she saw it as Bunik had. A crescent star overlooking a stylized bird greeted her, both bound in the center by three simple but significant runes of triangular shape. The Archmage gasped. She had seen this symbol before and she recalled just where. Returning her attention to Bunik, Jaina asked, was there anything else? Tonka was gone. Jaina squinted and saw a few tracks leading off beyond her... Beyond the ribcage. 
She should have expected that a hunter would be skilled in moving stealthily, but not only had Bunique evaded the Archmage's enhanced senses, but she had done so with astonishing swiftness. Moreover, Jaina had no idea why Bunique had left without warning, although perhaps the simple fact that Jaina was a spellcaster was answer enough. She dismissed the Taunka from her thoughts. Jaina needed to return to the books immediately. It was possible that this clue would be nothing more than a dead end, but from what the Archmage already recalled of the pages she intended to hunt down again, she doubted that would be the case. Her hopes rising, Jaina silently thanked the absent Bunique for having still been in the region hunting, then cast a spell to return herself to her sanctum. Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think this Bunique is possibly an avatar of someone. Or maybe a spirit. <clears throat> but had the Archmage chosen to glance one more time at where the Tonka had stood, she might have this time noticed that there were no hoof prints anywhere. Kallik did not recall so many proto-dragons collected at the previous gatherings. Their numbers were staggering. Through Malagos, he saw more family patterns than he had known existed among the proto-dragons. Even Malagos appeared somewhat awed by the legions around him. Although it, beca it quickly became clear that he was there not because he wanted to be, but because Tyr had asked him to be. The others were also present, but scattered among the many. Even Isera was there, having been located by Alexstrasza in a narrow ravine riddled with small caves. Maligos' thoughts constantly went to Isera, who appeared to be a tremendous question mark in whatever Tyr had planned with the Five. Maligos' concern over Isera overwhelmed Kallak's ability to understand what the plan involved. From what Kallak could sense about Isera, the others believed that she hid some secret from them, something she would not even speak of to Alexstrasza. Isera had too readily agreed to come with them, as if eager to be away from the area in which they had found her. All of that left Malagos wondering if the pale yellow female would suddenly abandon the attack at just the critical moment for whatever she kept from them. Fragmented memories concerning Tyr revealed a surprise to Kallak. His host was still the only one who knew of the cloaked figure. Tyr wanted to work through Malagos, believing that it would be best if the others thought that it was the icy blue male who had come up with the plan. Kallak gathered that for the that the reason for the secrecy had to do something with Tyr had not revealed even to Malagos, perhaps some portion of the plan that Kallak's host might have rejected. <clears throat> and not at all to his surprise, Malagos suspected something similar. Kalanixa roared again, her cry the signal for a new chorus of challenges focused on the yet unseen Galakrond. In truth, the collective roar seemed as impressive to Kallak as that of the distant behemoth, and he began to wonder if perhaps Kalanixa had chosen the right course of action after all. Out of the corner of his eye, Malagos watched Isera suddenly drop below the rest. He immediately dived after her. She looked up as he neared, her eyes narrowed. Malagos' suspicions of trouble heightened. Stay with us, he called. We must lead the others high. Only resting, tired. It was true that Isera did not have the stamina of the others and that there had been little time for her to rest since Malagos had gathered his companions and told them of his plan, but the male remained distrustful. Fortunately for him, Alexstrasza chose that moment to join them. "'You are well,' she anxiously asked her sister. "'Just tired.' Ysera seemed no happier to see Alexstrasza than she had been to see Malagos. "'I will stay with you until we need to rise higher.' Alexstrasza gave Malagos a glance of dismissal. The male quickly veered away from the sisters. The fire-orange female would keep a proper eye on Ysera. The plan tier had suggested could still... A roar a hundred times more resounding shook both the land and the air. The great formation created by Talonixa briefly lost order. She snarled furiously at her followers, bringing them back in line. Yet still there was no sign of Galakrond. Talonixa laughed. You see, he fears us. It was the moment that Malagos had been waiting for, and thus it was also the moment when his thoughts on the plan grew clear for Kalak. Height. The plan involved height. Tyr knew something about Galakron that the proto-dragons did not. The higher up, the thinner the air. That much even Malagos knew. However, the limit to how high Galakron could fly for more than a few minutes was lower than that of the smaller flyers. The key to victory lay in drawing the monster up where he would grow more sluggish, be forced to gasp for the air needed to fill his massive lungs. At that point, and perhaps only at that point, Galakron would be vulnerable. The icy blue male came up beside Talonixa. Must fly high, very high. Galakron cannot fly high long. Cannot breathe well there. The imposing female snorted. No way. Fly high, Malagos insisted. Galakron cannot breathe well there. Will tire. 
will fail. This time, Talonix appeared to consider his suggestion. Tyr and Malagos had counted on her cunning to enable this plan to work. Malagos exhaled in relief. It was a mistake. Talonix's expression hardened. Both Kallik and his host realized that she took Malagos's reaction for satisfaction at her having to bow to his wisdom. She snapped at Malagos. Simultaneously, two of her lieutenants dived in to aid her. As if out of nowhere, Neltharion and Nosdormu joined Malagos. Neltharion let out a challenging roar, which was answered by both of Talonix's followers. Behind the six, the rest of the proto-dragons faltered, uncertain whether their charge had not turned into a war among their own members. Retreat, Nosdormu hissed to Malagos. Retreat. Neltharion also heard the other male's warning. No, fight her! Become Alpha! Command all! Unlike Nosdormu, Neltharion had not bothered to be quiet. His words sent Talonixa into a rage. She unleashed a bolt not at Neltharion, but at the trio's apparent leader, Malagos. Kallax's host twisted, but still received a painful scorch on one wing. As he did, more of Talonixa's most loyal followers joined. Retreat, Nosdormu urged once more. Malagos did not dive, as might have been expected, but rather pushed higher. His comrades followed without question, and behind them several of Talonixa's acolytes pursued. But the pursuers stopped short at an abrupt snarl from the female. As Malagos continued rising higher, he glanced down to see the formation tightening again. He had hoped that Talonix and her lieutenants would give chase, possibly leading the rest of the proto-dragons upward after all. Smart. Momentum pushed Malagos into the clouds. Flying became more of a strain as the air thinned. He paused, waiting for the other two to catch up. Knew this would fail, Neltharion rumbled. Told you! Malagos did not answer. Kallik sensed there, that there had been more complexity to Tyr's plan and that Malagos silently berated himself for misplaying the situation. Based on what he could read of his host's thoughts, Kallik could find no fault in the proto-dragon's actions, but the blue dragon knew that there were things still hidden from him. What now? Nosdormu asked. Follow from above, Malagos told him. Alexstrasza, Isera, they join soon. In truth, Malagos had some doubts about Isera's resolve, but he was certain that Alexstrasza would bring her sister along. Kallik saw that his host also had a secondary plan in mind, still based on Tyr's original notions. Already aware that Talonixa might not listen to reason, Malagos had suggested that the five of them could yet lure Galagrond up by attacking him from above. It was a more desperate hope, but still a hope. Glancing down, Nosdormu muttered, They move on. As he warned, the proto-dragon's blow were already far ahead. Malagos saw no sign of the sisters, but could not delay. He would have to trust in Alexstrasza. Come! Not bothering to wait, the icy blue male flew through the clouds after Talonix's legions. In order to keep her followers together and not too exhausted to fight Galakron, the female had to set a pace that some of the slower fighters could keep. Malagos soon not only caught up to those below, but also began to pass them. The clouds thickened ahead. Malagos did not fear finding Galakron among them. The gargantuan fiend could never have hidden his bulk in the clouds, no matter how dense they became. Unfortunately, as he pressed... Kallik's host began to flag for the very reason that he had tried to convince Talonixa to lead the others up. The thin air had his breathing becoming more and more ragged. He had not intended to fly this much above the ground until almost upon Galakron, but now he wanted to avoid being seen by Talonixa or her followers. Neltharion caught up to him. He too looked to be struggling for air. Must fly lower. Something collided with Neltharion. <clears throat> this chapter did say undead, so I bet you they're going to fight undead. The proto-dragon went flying backward, the momentum of the thing that had flown into him, sending the charcoal gray male hurling uncontrollably. Malagos immediately turned about, hoping that it was not too late to help his friend. Only then did he see that what had struck Neltharion was one of the not living. Indeed, its stench spread even through the thin air as it and the living proto-dragon tumbled together. Curiously, Malagos noticed that the undead seemed to have collided with Neltharion at an angle that meant any attack of consequence initially impossible. It dawned on both Kallik and his host that the animated corpse had not actually attacked Neltharion, but rather had simply run into him by accident in the dense clouds. In fact, the undead almost seemed more interested in flying on than in fighting. Neltharion evidently noticed this too, for he pushed himself away from the monster and let it move on. The undead slowly began circling back the way it had come, or it would have, if Neltharion had not taken advantage of its ignorance of him by ripping its neck out from behind, then tearing both wings with his powerful hind claws. The charcoal gray proto-dragon watched with amusement as the sundered parts dropped and Malagos and Nosdormu rejoined him. Stupid creature, Neltharion mocked. Brain, all rot, 
Not even see or fight now. Strange, Nose Dormu murmured. Malagos and Kalik very much agreed with Nose Dormu's succinct assessment. Malagos' gaze followed the estimated path the undead would have taken, had Notharian not destroyed it. An uneasy feeling filled Kalik's host. Follow, he hissed. Quickly but carefully, Malagos pushed higher, despite the increasing desire to drop to thicker air. So pressed was the proto-dragon that Kalik could not at first fathom what so bothered him. And then as they reached a slight break within the cloud cover, what Malagos had feared became evident to his unseen companion. The sky was filled with undead. They circled constantly, as if that was the only desire left in their putrefying brains. Over and over they circled, some in great arcs, some in tight ones. One flew much too near Malagos, but did not take any notice of him. Malagos and Nosdormu caught up with him, and even the charcoal gray male appeared stunned. So many! Almost as many as us! There had been a few sightings of the undead, but in the growing anticipation of battling Galakron, the living proto-dragons had not paid that much mind, not even Malagos. Now that lapse was coming back to haunt them. Why, why here? Why do they just fly circles? Nosdormu asked. Kalak knew, and so did Malagos. They wait for us, for all of us. They wait? They wait? Neltharion shook his head. They not smart, no thinking. Malagos nodded. The undead proto-dragons had no true minds, but something they were bound to did. No, Galakron smart. Galakron thinks. He thinks very well. It was a frustratingly uncomplicated way of phrasing it, but Kalik saw that somehow the other two understood what Malagos tried to convey. As for the dragon, he shared both his host's astonishment and his growing fear.